Um, I wanted to first welcome our gold member, and that's Energized Nurses Home Health Care and Energized Healthcare Staffing. And wanted to also let you know that on July 30th, we will have care for the caregiver. Uh, Steve will be sending out a link for that. Please join that uh, webinar series on July 30th, Care for the Caregiver. Wanted to just make sure that you knew that Darlene Marinelli, our president, will be sending out, um, she'll be emailing you so that you can uh, give her updated information if you've changed anything for our guide. Our guides, we're getting down to the last minute now and we need to make sure that your information is accurate. So at this point, let me introduce you to our speaker of the day. Um, Dr. Matthew Mintz is a clinical associate professor of medicine at George Washington University. And he also has a, pr a private practice in Bethesda. And he will be speaking to us today on medical cannabis for older adults. And I'm going to now ask Dr. Mintz to um, share a little bit about his background, what brought him to this place in his life, and, and we'll go from there. Sorry about all of the a mess up this morning. <laughs> not a problem. Dr. Uh, Mintz. Not a problem. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, thank you for having me uh, to your meeting. Um, again, my name is uh, Matthew Mintz. Uh, uh, you know, as Jennifer said, uh, I, uh, I'm faculty at George Washington University. I was actually full-time faculty at George Washington University for about 20 years. Um, uh, split my time between uh, teaching and seeing patients. Um, and then after about three years ago, I decided uh, for a number of reasons, commute being one of them, I live in Rockville and uh, commuting downtown to DC with, if after 20 years was getting a little too hard. I decided to open up my own practice uh, in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, much closer to where I live. Uh, the type of practice that I have is a membership practice. Um, uh, some people refer to that as a concierge practice. Uh, it's a very small practice. We offer patients same day appointments, next day appointments, 24-7 uh, phone access um, uh, for an annual uh, membership fee. Um, and uh, what I found is, is that uh, senior, what we do is we take the pain point out of the healthcare system. And because seniors um, touch our healthcare system so many times, uh, it, it turns out that a lot of my patients uh, are now seniors. I'm not a uh, board certified geriatrician, but I have a uh, slightly geriatric practice just because a lot of seniors see value in that. Uh, but I'm not going to talk to you about my practice today. I just want to give you some background. What I am going to talk to you about uh, is, is medical cannabis and particularly how it relates to seniors. Um, so as I mentioned, I started my practice about uh, three years ago. And as you can imagine, uh, starting a practice, um, you know, it takes some time and things are a little bit slow in the beginning. And, and, um, and so that was, that was the case with me as well. And uh, again, started in July and several months later, I found out that a medical cannabis dispensary had moved into my medical building. And I'll be honest, I really didn't know a whole lot about medical cannabis that had been legalized in DC where I was practicing uh, for a little while, but practically wasn't available. Uh, but I was curious, so I went and I spoke with the owners, <clears throat> excuse me, about a month or so before it even opened, and they were telling me about medical cannabis, and they also mentioned um, that there are very few providers that had actually signed up. And so I figured, you know, I didn't really know much about it. What was the harm if they wanted to send me up a few patients to certify for medical cannabis? What would be in the harm with that? I wasn't really that busy at that point in time anyway. And I'll admit, I was a little bit concerned. I was a little worried that people would be coming to see me for sort of an illegal excuse to get pot. Uh, but very quickly, uh, my, my, my attitude changed uh, drastically. Uh, the first patients that I saw uh, were very ill, uh, many of them seniors, uh, patients with stage four cancer, um, just trying to get some pain relief um, or get uh, uh, decrease their side effects from their chemotherapy. People with chronic debilitating pain on narcotics, that were just looking for an alternative or a way to lower their doses. People with severe anxiety or insomnia that nothing had worked and really was looking for an alternative. And so, uh, you know, I, I, and I soon saw the benefit of cannabis for all these really sick people. And as a doctor, that's what you like to do. You like to make uh, people better. And so, uh, so that's how I sort of embarked on this. And I realized if I'm going to be certifying 
for medical cannabis, I better, this, this is not just a hobby. I really need to learn about this. And surprisingly, uh, there was not a lot available. We'll talk a little bit about why that's the case. Um, but, um, you know, and I had to do my own research. I had to take the few courses that I could find. I had to do my own reading and research. And uh, to the point that, that I've actually, I'm coming out now with a book. Uh, hopefully it'll be published in the fall on uh, medical cannabis and CBD uh, from a patient perspective, since there really isn't anything out there to my knowledge that has sort of the patient perspective that's written by a doctor who actually sees patients. So with all that research that I've done, with all that I've, I've certified now over a thousand patients, I'm going to, as quickly and concisely as I can, try to share that information with you. Um, and then, you know, with the time that we have remaining, take any of your questions, because a lot of people ask me a lot of questions. So what I'd like to start with is this concept of plants as medicine. And, and we've been using plants as medicines for, for millennium. Um, you know, the, a lot of the medicines that we use today have their origins in plants. So if any of you have clients or patients or loved ones that were on digoxin or chitalis, which is a medicine that we still to this day use for heart failure, that came from the foxglove plant. Um, a lot of the medicines that we use for blood pressure or emphysema uh, are atropine based and that comes from the nightshade plant. Um, even uh, taxol, which is a chemotherapeutic agent, is derived from the bark of the Pacific yew tree. Uh, and of course, a good example is a lot of narcotics that we use are, of course, they're narcotics. So they're derived from the uh, poppy seed plant. That's how you make opium, uh, but it's also how you make some of the pain medicines uh, that we have. So this idea of plants as a medicine uh, is, is not a new one. And in fact, uh, use of uh, cannabis uh, dates back as far, at least as text we can see in ancient Chinese medicine in, you know, centuries ago, Indian Ayurvedic medicine centuries ago. Uh, there were reports back in Greek and Roman times that it was used. Uh, the first real uh, sort of documentation was in the early 1800s. There was a uh, Dr. William O'Shaughnessy who uh, traveled into India and wrote a treatise on them using uh, hemp or ganja. Uh, and then uh, fast forward to the 19th and early 20th century, we actually use cannabis in regular medicine. If you were to go to sort of the local pharmacy, the five and dime, if you will, and you were gonna get a tonic or elixir, a lot of them had cannabis components in those major pharmaceutical manufacturers like Park Davis and Eli Lilly had cannabis-based products. Um, and they were very, very popular. And uh, it was almost mainstream medicine until 1937. And in 1937, uh, they had the Marijuana Tax Act. Uh, essentially, if you think about the times and prohibition, there were not only concerns about alcohol, but uh, concerns about marijuana and abuse of that, and the movie Reefer Madness, all that stuff led to the political will of taxing cannabis to such a high degree that it, its use fell out of favor. And you really didn't see a lot of medicinal marijuana. It wasn't until the 60s where people were experimenting with drugs and all sorts of things uh, where you got some anecdotal reports from cancer patients that the marijuana that uh, they had tried to help with their symptoms, specifically nausea, was really, really helpful. Uh, 1964 is where Dr. Bakum actually uh, did some research in Israel and isolated uh, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is THC, which is the molecule of the component of cannabis uh, that exerts a lot of its properties. We'll talk about THC in a second. And things seemed like they were turning in a different direction until the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. This is what gave the federal government and the FDA uh, authority to uh, regulate different substances. And so, uh, for example, the narcotics that we use today are, are controlled substances. They're Schedule II drugs. There are a lot of rules and regulations about how doctors prescribe them and who can prescribe them to make sure they're not abused. Scheduled I drugs are, the, by the FDA standard, the riskiest drugs. They, by definition, are a high abuse potential and have no accepted medicinal use. And at the time, marijuana was scheduled as a Scheduled I drug. Um, and there was actually a commission that looked at the time to try to decriminalize it and not make it a, a Schedule I drug, but there was a lot of politics involved. Uh, the Nixon administration at the time felt that legalizing medical cannabis, at least, uh, would, would not be good for the you know, for the liberals who were against him and his war. And so they kept marijuana as a scheduled one drug, essentially making it federally illegal. And it remains there to that date. Uh, what changed was in the 90s with the HIV epidemic, where you had patients 
who became their own advocates because the government wasn't helping. And there are lots of movies and stories about that. But in addition to these buyers clubs and, and things of that nature, they started using medical cannabis. And in 1996, California was the first state to legalize uh, medical cannabis. And since that time, since the 90s and 2000s, over the last few decades, more and more states have legalized medicinal marijuana. Uh, and uh, we, it's now legal in 33 states and the District of Columbia, and there's certainly uh, more to come. Um, so, so that's sort of a background of sort of how medical cannabis came to be currently. Um, what I'd like to do now is to get everyone on the same page, talk a little bit about the science behind medical cannabis, as well as what we can use it for. And then I'll take any of your questions that you have. So I'm going to attempt to uh, share my screen here. Um, I think this is going to work. Uh, Steve, just if you can see my screen, just shout out. Just looks so I know. good. Yep, All right, thank you. Good. All right, very good. All right. So the first thing, the way medical cannabis works uh, is through something called the endocannabinoid system. And we have lots of systems in our body. We have the respiratory system, uh, which helps us with breathing. We have the cardiovascular system, the central nervous system. And systems do something. They're usually a combination of organs and receptors and chemicals that do things. And, the, and we have an endocannabinoid system. What endocannabinoid system or the ECS does is it maintains what's called homeostasis or balance. So it helps regulate things that are important to keeping things normal. So appetite and pain and energy and immunity and metabolism and sleep and things like that. And we have two types of receptors in our body called cannabinoid receptors or CB receptors. There are two, there are CB1 receptors, which are primarily in the brain and nervous tissue. And there are CBD2 receptors that are in the blood and the gut. Um, and so those receptors are, um, are recognize um, chemicals in our body called uh, cannabinoids. These are uh, molecules that are made in by the brain that hit those receptors uh, to, uh, to affect some sort of change in homeostasis. And the two main ones we have are anandamide or 2-AG. So we have an endocannabinoid system that helps regulate balance things like metabolism and sleep and pain. And there are cannabinoid receptors throughout our body and our brain, our body makes natural endocannabinoids. Um, so here's just a slide of, uh, of an MRI showing uh, CB1 receptors in the brain. Here's a slide showing CB2 receptors in some of the organs and the bone. And we've had this endocannabinoid system for millions and millions of years. In fact, all vertebrate species have it. It's been around for 600 million years. And I mentioned that because the cannabis plant itself has only been around for 25 million years. So it's not like we evolved uh, and developed these receptors or, and the system based on the plant. It has nothing to do with that. This is something that we naturally have uh, that evolutionary has protected us that all vertebrate uh, uh, animals have. Uh, and the plant it came at a much, 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 millions and millions of years later. So let's talk about um, medical marijuana. So essentially, uh, marijuana has, is a plant. It's got 100 uh, or more biologically active ingredients, including several uh, substances called cannabinoids. And cannabinoids, just like the endocannabinoids, also hit those receptors, those CB1, CB2 receptors. So their plant-based cannabinoids are also called phytocannabinoids. And there's a bunch of them. The two main ones are THC and CBD. So THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, that's the thing in cannabis or marijuana that makes you high um, and also makes you sleepy. But it's really good for pain. It's really good for sleep. At high doses can cause anxiety, but in low doses uh, can make you relax. It's good for uh, uh, appetite stimulation. CBD is different. It is non-psychoactive. It's not going to make you high. It's not going to make you uh, sleepy. Uh, it has some synergistic properties, so it's also good for anxiety, but it also has some other things. Uh, it's good for um, uh, um, inflammation. Uh, it actually suppresses appetite. It has some anti-cancer properties. So they're sort of, they're, they're not opposite, but they sort of work synergistically together. So that's THC and CBD. Now, the, one of the, a lot of questions I get is CBD versus marijuana. And so I'm going to answer that right off the top because I, I get that all the time because you see CBD stuff all over the place. So marijuana is a plant. Uh, it has lots of cannabinoids, including CBD and THC. As I mentioned, it is federally illegal, uh, but it's legally medically in 33 states and in about 11 states, it's recreationally legal. 
And when you get products, and we'll talk about the products in a second, it comes in different ratios of THC to CBD and things like that. However, CBD by itself also has some of those medicinal properties that I mentioned. Specifically, CBD by itself is good for inflammation and it's good for anxiety. Um, there's another plant called hemp which is basically another form essentially of marijuana, except it has virtually no THC. And because it has almost no THC, it is illegal everywhere in the United States. And so there's no real difference in the effects of hemp-based CBD or marijuana-based CBD. It's really the legality issue. Um, and so you can get CBD uh, almost anywhere much easier. It's uh, being sold all over the place at a much lower cost. Now, the only downside of hemp-based CBD is not regulated by the FDA. So, for example, if you go to a, a Vita, if you go to CVS or GNC and you buy a vitamin, uh, you may not know, there might not be enough evidence whether it works or not, but you at least know what you're getting because there's regulation, there's a UPC symbol, so you know the ingredients of what you're buying or what's in there. But that's not the case with CBD. CBD is in this no man's land state because the FDA hasn't decided how it wants to regulate it. And so because of that, you know, it's a buyer beware. I mean, you can get CBD in Bed Bath & Beyond, you can get it online on a million sites, um, but it's not regulated. So you have to be really, really careful. Uh, and there's a bunch of things that you need to look for if you're going with hemp-based CBD. It has to be a good, you know, good company. They have to have respectable growing practices, like no pesticides, no GMOs. But the most important thing is it has to be verified by a third party uh, so you know exactly what you're getting. Uh, which is why, and there's only about 11 or 12 companies in the United States that I'm aware of that do this good growing process and verified by a third party. And so the company, I actually started offering CBD to my patients. I didn't think I'd ever go into retail, but because it's just so hard to get good high quality CBD. So the product that I use uh, is from CBD Distillery, which is pictured there. Uh, and that's what I use and what I recommend for my patients. Now, in addition to the cannabinoids, there's also uh, substances called terpenes. They're aromatic substances that give the cannabis plant its smell and its flavor. It's in normal things. So for example, I don't know if you can see the wheel, but limonene is a terpene. That's what gives citruses and lemons its, its smell. So these are natural substances that occur in all sorts of plants and fruits. But in addition to the smell, they also have some uh, um, um, medicinal properties. So myrcene, for example, is a very common terpene that I recommend. It's really good for relaxation. It's a good muscle relaxant as well. And so, so you have different strains of the plant that have different, um, different um, you know, balances of terpenes and, and, and CBD and THC. And it's, it's really the strain of the plant uh, and all that components of it that really give it its medicinal properties. So uh, if we zoom on this wheel, uh, these are a couple of strains that are high in humulene. And so um, if you look, the, the, the symbols there are, are, are you know, the, the, unfortunately, they're not names that are familiar like Lipitor and, and, and uh, Nexium. They have funny names that date back to the recreational use, like Girl Scout cookie and things like that. So the medical cannabis industry has a little bit of a marketing issue. But nonetheless, when, when I'm selecting strains for patients, it has to do with their, not only the THC and the CBD, but their terpene profile. The final thing, which is very interesting, has to do with something called the entourage effect. So it's not just the terpenes, it's not just the cannabinoids, it's not just the CBD or the THC, but it's how all of these things work together. And whereas the sum is greater than uh, the additive of the parts, there's something magical about the way in which all of these things work together at the set receptors that do better than just the one thing. So for example, mm -hmm. synthetic THC has been around for a very long time. Um, uh, and has been used for nausea, but it doesn't seem to work nearly as well uh, as natural plant-based uh, marijuana, medical marijuana. Uh, there's two ways to divide the strains up. There's sativa strains, and indica strains. In general, sativa strains are more alerting, give you increased energy. They're uplifting. Indica strains are more re relaxing. They're better for sleep. You can have hybrid strains or strains that are predominant in, in one or more. Now, the other thing is about formulation. And um, there are various ways in which you can consume uh, medical cannabis. I Certainly you can smoke it, but I never recommend that patients smoke. Smoking is not good for you. It's also not a very good dosing mechanism. But cannabis comes in a variety of different um, ways that you can get it. There are pills or edibles where it looks, if you can see here, just like any other prescription. There are tinctures or drops 
which you can drop under your tongue. The other thing that you can do is you can take the leaf, you can extract the oil and all the cannabinoids and terpenes, and you can put that concentrated oil in a device that almost looks like an electronic cigarette, and there's, it's battery powered, you can inhale it, and that's called vaping, which is also another safe way. So there's, there's creams, there's tinctures, there's pills, there's vapes, there's all sorts of ways to use it without smoking. All right. Quickly, there's lots of different uses for medical cannabis. I'm not going to go into all of them, um, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a few. But the other thing that I also like to talk about is, is the safety issue. And so especially we're talking about seniors here. You know, if you think about safety issues, is this going to cause side effects? Is this going to be addictive? Is this going to kill me? So this is a chart that graphs dependence potential. In other words, how addictive it is against lethality, or what the lethal dose is, or the actually the active dose to lethal dose ratio. So if you look at marijuana, you can see it actually is very low in addiction. It's not more addictive than let's say caffeine, and very very low in lethality. No one's really overdosed or died uh, from marijuana, either recreational or cannabis. Uh, if you look on the opposite, you can see even alcohol. Uh, while it is only moderately addictive, though more addictive than cannabis, its lethality is actually pretty high. Now, you typically don't think of people dying from alcohol ingestion because usually, you know, after a couple drinks, people pass out or they get sick or whatever. But you have, I'm sure, heard of these cases where, you know, these college students, you know, drink too much alcohol, you know, that, um, you know, their body can't absorb it and you can die from alcohol poisoning. And of course, the narcotics uh, are both very lethal and very addictive, which is why we're sort of in the opioid crisis that we're in right now uh, and cannabis being low you know low in addiction and low in lethality can be potentially an alternative to the opioids now as i mentioned uh marijuana is federally illegal and what that does is it makes it in addition to to you know uh, usage it makes research really hard because a lot of the research is done by like nih which is a federal institution so nih which is right down the street from my office they can't touch this stuff or academic institutions like gw where i'm from even though they're not federal institutions they receive a lot of federal money and they're worried about doing this and they don't want to lose their federal funding and so there's not a ton there's not the kind of research that we need nonetheless there is research that exists and uh, the National Academies of Science, which is a large scientific group, reviewed all of the available research. And uh, what they found is they found at least three areas in which there was good, solid evidence using the highest standards that medical cannabis was helpful. And the three things were chronic pain, uh, particularly those who were on opioids, uh, for patients with multiple sclerosis, uh, looking at muscle spasms, and finally, um, uh, for um, uh, in, in patients uh, who had um, nausea, particularly um, uh, those with chemotherapy. So those are three um, areas in which uh, the experts looked at the evidence and there was clear evidence that it worked. Now there's lots of evidence for other disease states as well. It just did not meet the standards of this particular group. So briefly, if you look at pain, um, I think a couple things that are interesting. In states that have legalized medical cannabis, doctors are writing almost 2,000 fewer pain prescriptions per year per doctor in those states that have legalized medical cannabis uh, than those states that have not. Uh, and here is an overview of, um, of death rates, and you can basically see that states that have legalized medical cannabis have lower opioid death rates. Um, and you can see the death rates go down uh, once the state is legal from opioids, once the state has legalized marijuana. Again, that's not proof that marijuana can replace opioids, but suggests that there may be some role. Uh, this is a study that looked at uh, 244 patients uh, on medical cannabis, uh, and, uh, and they, a lot of them, about 64% were able to reduce their opioid use, and uh, uh, half of them had an improved quality of life. Anxiety is another really common thing that I see. Um, there is a low level of evidence that it works. THC, as I mentioned, at high doses can make you anxious. And that's why people sometimes say, well, I tried it in college uh, and it just made me paranoid. And probably because you smoked it, you took too much. But at very low doses, uh, it can be effective. CBD at any dose it actually has some uh, uh, anti-anxiety properties. Uh, here's one study in a VA population. Uh, with PTSD, and they found it reduced their symptoms by 75%, uh, so it works there. Uh, cancer is also a very interesting area. I see a lot of patients and certified patients for cancer. There's actually four ways to use medical marijuana in cancer. One is to help reduce the symptoms caused by cancer, so 
Uh, cancer can cause wasting. It can cause pain if it's metastasized. Lots of different symptoms that it's good for. Uh, it can uh, help uh, reduce uh, the symptoms from cancer treatment. I already mentioned uh, nausea from chemotherapy. Uh, patients also chemotherapy agents cause uh, neuropathy or pain or tingling in their extremities. It can be helpful with that. It also has anti-cancer properties, which is very fascinating and can actually, actually treat the cancer. I'm not recommending necessarily that people stop their chemotherapy, but it can be helpful in use with chemotherapy. And finally, at least in animal study, there's some suggestion that it may actually prevent cancer. So this would be a really good area of research that the NIH could do if it were federally legal. Uh, hopefully that'll happen. And then probably most importantly from your perspective is medical cannabis for seniors. Um, you know, I, as I mentioned, a lot of my patients are seniors. I was doing the medical cannabis thing and it sort of one day occurred to me like, you know, why am I going to give this, you know, 85 year old woman who can't sleep Ambien, which is going to cause lots of side effects or interactions with her medicine, when medical cannabis is probably a lot safer and at least as effective. And it, so it got to me thinking that the seniors are really a good population uh, for medical cannabis, primarily because it treats a variety of the conditions that seniors have. They have aches and pains, they have anxiety, they have problems sleeping. For patients with dementia, they can get anorexia and agitation. And cannabis helps with all of these things with very few side effects. Like I said, it's, it's, un, it's not, it, it has almost no risk of killing you or hurting you. It is a very low risk of, of addictions. And it also does not have too many interactions with all the meds that many of our patients or clients take. So you can, in fact, you could actually reduce some of the medicines. If you, if you use just cannabis, you can get rid of some of those medicines they're taking for those conditions. So I think it has a really, really good role. And I'm recommending it now to a lot of my regular patients instead of prescription medicines. Um, there is one, I think, really important study. There's not a lot of research in general, but specifically in seniors, but I like to show this one last study because it has almost 3,000 seniors. There's not too many studies that do that, uh, who had medical cannabis, were receiving it for over a year. Um, and again, it's a survey study, so it looked at their perceptions, not the most rigorous study, but uh, almost all of the seniors who took medical cannabis saw some improvement. Most of them saw a moderate or significant improvement, but almost no senior didn't see anything. Uh, so almost all of them said it helped with their symptoms. And if you look at the most important thing is if you look at the side effects, uh, the top three were dizziness at uh, almost 10%, dry mouth at 7%, and uh, sleepiness at 4%. Everything else was pretty low. And so this is a very uh, favorable if you look at other medicines, prescription medicines, and side effects. This is much better than a lot of the common medicines that we, you know, blood pressure medicines, diabetes medicines, et cetera. It's actually a really low risk of side effects. Uh, compared to, to others. Um, and, you know, one, I, don't, I don't have the data slide for this, but, you know, falls obviously, you know, is a concern with seniors. And if they're going to be dizzy, that's a concern. There's actually a study in New York where they looked at seniors that were enrolled in their medical cannabis program, and they found no increased risk of falls. So uh, I still think, while you know, nothing is completely safe. I think, you know, the safety and plus the benefit, I think, is a really, and things, the multiple things it treats, I think, really helps. As, as I mentioned, I am, you know, I've taken all, this is just a quick version of all the information that I've compiled. I'll be coming out uh, with a book shortly um, in the process of publication, uh, you know, with a lot of this type of information that hopefully uh, patients uh, can use uh, to determine if uh, cannabis is, is helpful and CBD is helpful for them. And so I'll be sure to let Steve uh, know when that book is available. You can also, it'll also be on my website, which I've, I've posted before. So again, here is my uh, contact information. Again, my name is Dr. Matthew Mintz. I'm an internist, uh, primary care physician in Bethesda. Uh, you can always email me. You can go to my website and call us if you have any questions. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will turn it over to Steve. And I think we have a bunch of time to answer your questions. Great, uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Mintz, and let me let me bring our host Jennifer back on as well. And um, let's see, we got a few hands raised here. Uh, first, so everybody, uh, you can raise your your hand, or you can type in questions to Q and A. And let's see, we've got Carrie. Um, Carrie. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Good. Thank you, Doc, for the presentation. Uh, I was uh, very interested because I'm, I'm, I was concerned. I wanted to hear this presentation because 
you know, we give all our caregivers drug screenings. So I was worried about folks being smoking around them. And I do have a situation where I have a client that does smoke. So I was interested in hearing your statement that uh, they shouldn't smoke, uh, but what if the clients are? Well, that then becomes a, that becomes a policy decision. Um, I generally do not recommend patients smoke because obviously smoking is not good for you. Also, it's very hard to dose it that way. Um, there are, if, as long as you're getting it from a medical cannabis dispensary, the vaping is very safe. Um, something that I don't recommend, but I think is acceptable is there is a way to use the actual plant and inhale it, not the oil concentrate that I showed you, but there are devices that you can put the plant in that heats it up so that you're essentially inhaling the vapors without smoking it. So you can use the plant product. There are so many ways to use it that I don't think smoking it is a really good idea. Um, again, people, it's, you know, it's medically legal. So once a patient gets certified, they can sort of do whatever they want. Um, I, and I generally don't recommend that patients smoke as a doctor. I can't recommend that people do something that might be harmful to them. Um, from a, if you're, you know, an assisted living or you have a facility that becomes then your decision, it's legal in the state of Maryland, but it's a private facility. You can decide what your staff and your residents do. Well, well, the, my question was going somewhere else that we, we're in a business where we give drug screenings to our employees. Mm -hmm. So if, if we have a client that smokes, what is the medical community saying about how do we protect companies and individuals who are exposed to this? Well, again, as an employer, you can have whatever policy that you want. So for example, you, so here, so the general solution to this from an employee standpoint, by the way, I'm not an employee expert. I'm just, I've advised some companies, but, I'm not an expert in this, but, but, I, but one of the things that they can do is they can say, well, if you test pot, we're going to test you for drugs. And if you test positive for cannabis, then you need to show documentation uh, that you're using medicinal cannabis. Because, you know, when I certify people, I give them essentially documentation uh, that they meet the state's criteria. And so, you know, so in Maryland, it is not uh, recreationally legal. It's only medicinally legal. So if people have cannabis in their system, uh, you know, it's probably because they're using it recreationally and not medicinally. And so that's how a lot of companies, you know, for example, the teachers, we don't want the teachers, you know, being high in the classroom. I think it's reasonable for us to screen them, but some of them may have issues where they're using medical marijuana appropriately. And that's how I think the county or the police, uh, the police actually, county, I've spoken to the county a couple of times. That's how they're doing it, is they're, they're making people present a, a medical certification certificate. Another quick question. You, you mentioned that vaping is not smoking. What is vaping then? Uh, that's a good question. So in general, so I'll answer it's a two-parter, even though you only asked the first part. So basically what vaping is, is that you take a liquid version and you heat it up, usually in a battery-powered device, and you inhale it. So it's not smoking. Smoking is basically combustion. It's when you're burning something when there's ash. And that's the reason why the smoking is bad for you because you're combusting something and you're inhaling ash into your lung. When you're vaping something, you're basically inhaling a heated liquid or a vapor or a gas. And so that doesn't have the same damage to the lung. The second part of the question, which you didn't ask me, but I'm going to answer anyway, is aren't there concerns about vaping? And so the answer is sort of. Uh, about a year ago, there was a big scare with vaping uh, and the CDC actually tracked down what it was. And essentially these were not in medical cannabis vapes or even the vapes that you could buy at like Walgreens, like Juul, the electronic cigarette vapes, but actually illegally made electronic cigarettes. And essentially what these illegal manufacturers were doing is they put vitamin E into the, the, the cartridge with the nicotine. Now, why vitamin E? No, they weren't trying to make their clients healthy. Uh, the, 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 the density and viscosity of vitamin E was similar to the liquid. So they're sort of like watering down the wine. They were trying to save some money. Uh, and while vitamin E might be healthy when ingested, it is not healthy when inhaled in the lungs and caused a lot of serious lung damage. So, um, so the CDC identified that. And there are certainly some concerns with other vapes, especially those that are manufactured overseas. But as long as you get a vape from a medical, a Maryland medical cannabis dispensary, it's safe because it's hot. The, the, the great thing about medical marijuana as opposed to recreational marijuana is the regulation that they, when you get something from a dispensary, you know exactly what's in it. You know the cannabinoids, you know the THC CBD ratio, you know the terpene profiles, you know the milligrams, but you also know what's not in it. There's no pesticides, there's no chemicals, and there's no vitamin E. So as long as you get a vape from a medical cannabis dispensary, it's very safe.
very different than if you go online and buy some e-cigarette from China. That's probably not safe. Thank you. Thank you, um, Carrie. And let's see here. Um, it looks like Chandra has her hand raised. And while we're waiting for Chandra to come on, um, uh, I have a question from Sarah. Um, Sarah from Sarah's Peace and Love Home Healthcare. My question is, how does the cannabis help seniors who has heart disease and high blood pressure? And are there prescription drugs, but but the same time suffering from severe pain? Um, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interpret that question is that Sarah is concerned about um, blood pressure and heart effects from cannabis. Um, there, you know, cannabis doesn't really do much for high, I mean, it doesn't do, it does a lot of things, but not everything. It's not going to lower your cholesterol. Uh, it's not going to lower your blood pressure. Uh, it's, it, 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 it may help with diabetes, but that's questionable. Um, but it's not going to lower your blood pressure or help with heart issues or things like that. THC can actually raise your blood pressure and heart rate a little bit. Um, so that's why there might be some uh, uh, concern. Uh, but in all the studies that they've done, um, they haven't really found anything, you know, where it's going to cause heart attacks or strokes or anything like that. So it may raise the blood pressure a tiny bit, may raise the heart rate a little bit. Um, but as long as the patient's monitored by a physician, um, should not be an issue. The other thing too, again, I, I, so a little of a plug here, but this is why I think it's really important that patients do this with a physician that knows what they're doing about cannabis, whether it's myself or other physicians that are familiar with this, you know, you have to, especially with seniors who want a lot of medications, you have to do this really, really carefully. Um, so the other thing that with all patients, but especially seniors, the other thing is I start with very, very low doses. Another reason not to smoke is it's hard to get a low dose if you smoke it. I usually recommend, especially for seniors, like edibles and tinctures, where you're using just tiny amounts. So that's the other thing too. Tiny amounts of CHTHC should not cause significant, you know, uh, increases in blood pressure or heart rate. And so I do not think cannabis, if used correctly, is a risk for any of those patients, and therefore can treat their pain even if they have heart disease or high blood pressure. Hopefully that answers your question. Great. Um, and let's see. Uh, Peggy Wallace says, my son has chronic pain every day and the cost of CBD is high. How and where can we get it at a reasonable price? So the so it depends on where you're getting the CBD from. I mean, the cost of all of this stuff, even, you know, even CB, hemp based CBD is, it tends to be high. Again, insurance doesn't cover any of this stuff. Um, uh, hemp based CBD, uh, because it is not, because it is legal everywhere in the United States, uh, it tends to be a lot less. Uh, Marijuana-based CBD, especially in the state of Maryland, is actually quite expensive. You would think, well, it doesn't have the THC, it should be cheaper, but it actually that's not the case. The Maryland state law says that Maryland dispensaries can only sell products that are grown in the state of Maryland. And currently hemp is not grown in the state of Maryland. And so the same CBD that's legal everywhere in the United States, the dispensaries cannot sell to you. Um, some have gotten clever and have sold it like right outside their door, uh, but most of the dispensaries that offer CBD are uh, marijuana-based CBD, which is very expensive. Uh, in the doses that I recommend, which is generally about 25 to 30 milligrams a day, uh, if you buy the CBD from a dispensary, it can cost you up to like $300 a month, which is ridiculously expensive. Uh, that's why I recommend hemp-based CBD, uh, but you have to be careful. You have to get it from a good, reputable source. Um, and so I found out, of, I found that I did a lot of research on this. There's about 11 that I found were good uh, because, again, a lot of my patients are seniors and don't go online. I just decided to offer it uh, a wholesale, um, uh, you know, buy it wholesale and offer it to my patients. So I do actually uh, offer it to patients in my clinic uh, the products that I use uh, are from CBD Distillery. You can go to cbddistillery.com and get those products online. Uh, if you want to stop by my office, you don't have to be my patient. We can get you some CBD. You have to call first uh, due to the pandemic or not. We don't have an open door policy. You have to, you know, just let us know when you're coming so we can, you know, make sure that we're having a uh, safe social distancing for all our patients and our clients. But um, CBD Distillery is the, is the product that I use um, there's also the only place that I know of that sells really good high quality CBD is Mom's Organic Market. There's a few in our area. Uh, the product lines that they use is CBD Plus, 
uh, Jackson's Courage, Charlotte's Web. It's a little bit more expensive if you get there, but it's a lot more reasonable. Uh, what I sell in my office, it's uh, 50 bucks for a 30-day supply of capsules and 60 bucks for a 30-day supply of tincture. And I don't think you're going to find that price anywhere else. I'm not making a huge profit here. Uh, just really trying to help some patients. But hopefully that answers your question. Great. And uh, Charles Picard from Care Patrol has raised his hand. Um, so uh, let me see if he wants to ask his question on the air, so to speak. Um, while we're waiting for uh, Charles to um, unmute, Hi, oh, so my, my question was related to cost as well. For a lot of seniors who are having sleep issues, melatonin is prescribed, and sometimes that's effective, but not always. And I was wondering, how would you compare that to a cannabinoid product, and also in terms of cost? Uh, good question. So, the, so um, melatonin qu can be quite good, uh, pretty safe. Um, but THC is much better. Um, you know, the, the melatonin actually doesn't really make you that sleepy. It actually regulates the sleep-wake cycle, uh, which is thrown off in both kids and elderly populations, which is why it's a really good option. Uh, they can also be used in conjunction, too, so they're not mutually exclusive. And in fact, some of the cannabis products that are sold at dispensaries have melatonin in it. Um, of the products that I recommend, um, generally, uh, they come, for example, an edible that you might get. Uh, you can get like a f uh, 20 pills at five milligrams for $20. Um, generally, I recommend that patients start with at least half of that, but most people are fine with a five milligram pill. So, um, so if you, that's 20 days. So basically it's sort of $30, it's a dollar a day. Um, so, which is now, now some people need more. And so a lot of the, so part of the thing, a lot of the cost of cannabis is depends on how much you need. So if you need two pills to make you sleep, that cost is going to double. Uh, but most seniors, I think a pill a night uh, at five milligrams works pretty well. Again, it's about a dollar a pill or thirty dollars for a, you know for a thirty day supply. Uh, you can get melatonin a lot cheaper than that, but it's on par with over the counter stuff. Um, once you start getting into higher doses and different formulations, the price starts to go up. You know, vapes are more expensive, things like that, and the more you use. So so in general. And I often will recommend multiple products for patients. So CBD combined with a nighttime edible and maybe a daytime tincture. So I'm often recommending multiple products. So, you know, if you're using a couple products at a time, it can get into, you know, a hundred plus dollars per month, which is not nothing, but it can get as high as several hundred dollars, depending on how much you need and how much you use. Uh, but with seniors, again, we like to use low doses. So it's not ridiculous, but it's not cheap. Thank hey, you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Charles. Um, all right, uh, let's see, um, John, I think any we've, other got, questions? we've gone through the questions there, um, uh, if, but of course, whenever I say that, that's when a hand always pops up, um, but, but, uh, but, uh, but it looks like we're getting close to the end of the hour. So Jennifer, if you want to. Yes, well, I just wanted to, before, you know, you cut us all off, I wanted to thank Dr. Mintz for um, coming to, um, you know, our meeting this morning. And we will be looking forward to getting your book. And I'm sure several people have asked for your information. So I think that they're going to be reaching out to you um, after this session. But thank you so much for coming and bringing all of this information to us, um, just understanding the history behind um, the cannabis and um, just all of, all of the information, the studies that you've done and how you know, it's helping the seniors. Um, maybe they could reduce some of the other medications, less interactions with other medications. All of this stuff is really helpful information for us. So thank you again. And we might have some more questions, but we will be looking forward to getting your book and possibly even getting you back again. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me again. I posted um, my contact information in the chat uh, box like everyone else, and people can feel free to email me or call anytime. Okay. Yeah. Uh, does Charles have another question? Uh, no, no, we're, I think we're, we're good to go. Um, okay. You know, uh, although I, what I would say, I, I, whenever 
I'm able to get a doctor on one of these calls, I always love to just get some of your insights on, you know, your thoughts on COVID-19, anything, any words of wisdom that you can share with us as providers and, uh, um, uh, and, and, you know, again, I know that your, your practice is like all health practices has radically changed, uh, since, since this crisis. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's obviously, it's a complicated question with, with a few minutes left. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to give a, a few things. I think the main thing is, you know, again, with, with not trying not to get political, I think Maryland's done a pretty good job um, in terms of states where to have sort of shut things down relatively quickly uh, and continue to do well and not opened up too quickly. We've seen those numbers go down and stay down. And I think that's the, the true for, for Maryland. Um, unfortunately, we're not, you know, alone. And, um, you know, there are other places in the country that are not doing so well, and that can affect our state. Uh, but I've been monitoring the numbers pretty carefully. And while, you know, we're not, we're nowhere near out of the woods, our numbers are relatively low and have stayed low. Uh, the percent rate of positive testing uh, is low despite going high. So, I, we're not out of the woods yet, but 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 I but I but I think but I'm at least optimistic in our area that things will probably be okay. Uh, from from your standpoint as caregivers, who or or people who you know have clients that you that you know you sort of need to interact with, I think that's good because it lowers it makes us feel a little bit better that our overall risk is is lower at least from the caregiver standpoint. Um, and so, you know, it, this, it's not really rocket science. If we just social distance, wash our hands and wear masks, we're going to be fine. Why the rest of the country doesn't seem to understand that is, is a little crazy. But I think if we just use those common sense approaches, you know, we can probably do most of the things uh, that we were doing before. Uh, the real risk is really still for the, our, our clients or our patients, the seniors, because it's very clear that people who are older, who have heart disease or diabetes, are still at the highest risk. And until, you know, the vaccine is, is out, which I am, a I am slightly optimistic that we'll have a vaccine by the end of the year, beginning of the new year, until we have that way of protecting people and have better methods of treatment, our clients, patients, our seniors are still at very high risk. So we have to be you know, we still careful with them. And, you know, for, I'll just give you an example. My parents are seniors and I've still confined them to the house and to, I'm making sure that they're, you know, pretty much only going and taking walks outside and not going to the grocery store if they can avoid it and, and things like that. Uh, because even though our numbers are still low, they're still at risk. So, you know, I think it's, it's a mixed picture right now. I think, you know, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens when the kids go back to school. I think Maryland's taking a, I know PG County just yesterday announced that they're going to do online stuff. Maryland is a sort of a high, you know, Maryland, sorry, Montgomery County is sort of a, a hybrid. Um, but I think, our, you know, I think our state, our governor, our leaders have done the right thing and we're, it's paid off. And if we stay the course, I think that'll be okay. From a caregiver standpoint, I think that that should give you some reassurance that even though you're a frontline type of person, that as long as you're careful, you're not going to get it. And even if you do, you're probably not going to die from it. As long as you're not a high risk person, uh, there is still a risk to our seniors, our patients, our clients. And if we're careful, with them, I think we can help avoid them and stay healthy. And, you know, I think we're in this for a little bit longer, but I think if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to ride this out. We'll be, we'll be at least in the, our state, I think we'll be okay. I'm worried for other states like Florida and Arizona and stuff like that. But I think if we keep doing what we're doing, we'll be okay. Okay, great. And then uh, I knew that this would happen. And that's why I asked a, a question. Oh, this will be our last question from Ann Creighton. Do you know if CBD oil is useful for kids with autism? Um, good question. So both cannabis and CBD is useful uh, in autism. I have a whole chapter in my book about medical cannabis and autism uh, just because of this interesting thing. It's, it's, I mean, it, the answer is CBD might be able to help. Um, it's really, it's the cannabis that is actually probably even better, the marijuana, the THC that is even better. Um, and you can say, well, why, you know, you're going to use pot in children. But if you think about it, the main treatment uh, for agitation uh, in, in, in some of the other behaviors uh, in, in, in autistic children 
these uh, antipsychotic medicines uh, that have black box warnings that essentially snow these children so that they're not gonna hurt themselves or others. Um, cannabis can do the same thing without snowing them and without these, these risks. Now, you know, it, it's controversial because THC can, there's some issues in children, at least with brain development, so you have to be really, really careful. Uh, but I do actually recommend medical marijuana. I've seen a couple of actually, a uh, 12-year-old girl, 13-year-old girl, a couple patients that I've certified for medical cannabis for their autism. And if you go on the autism, like listservs and blogs and websites, there's a lot of information about, at least parents have found it very, very effective. So CBD might be able to help a little bit, but for the real severe cases, you're going to need cannabis. You're going to need medical cannabis and it can work. Excellent. All right. Well, hey, Jennifer. Well, thank you. Yes. Thank you again. And thank all the members for joining us today. Um, don't forget July 30th. And then, um, if anyone's interested in uh, joining as a member, um, our information is also in the chat box as well. Thank Great. you. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks.